So today I would like to tell you about the research done in my laboratory uh, that is investigating the molecular biology of pheromone perception in mammals. And what we are trying to do is to use molecular and genetic tools in order to understand the um, basic mechanism underlying instinctive behavior in mammals and in the particular example of smell, the control of reproductive and aggressive behavior. Um, there will be three parts in my talk. In the first part, I will introduce you to the system, in particular, the use of genes and molecular tools in order to investigate chemosensory detection in mammalian systems. In the second part, I will uh, more develop the type of research that is being performed in my lab in order to understand the molecular mechanism and the brain circuits that underlie pheromone perception leading to behavioral changes in the mammalian brain. And then in the final part, I will tell you more recent results uh, that investigate the specificity of the pheromone response. Why do male and female of a particular species respond differently to pheromonal cues? So the uh, introduction. So something that is very striking in animal behavior is how in many different species specific behaviors are really identical among all animals of a given species even when animals have been raised in isolation so for example within a given species of spider the web look really identical or the nest building in birds is also very striking a given species of birds will build um, a very sophisticated uh, nest with a very specific morphology over and over again even though animals are raised in isolation and really don't have the ability to learn from the other animal of the species. Similarly regarding social behavior courtship behavior, maternal behavior, social behavior uh, to the large extent also in, in some species appear very reproducible among all the animals of the given species. And this really raise a very specific uh, question which is what, I what are the mechanisms that really control those behavior? What is the relationship between genetic information um, that really provide uh, the animal with this um, uh, uh, information uh, that are common to all the species and the function of the brain. And um, we are particularly interested in studying this type of issue in mammals and in particularly in rodents. And the type of uh, question that uh, we are raising are as follows. First, we um, it's very clear that a number of behaviors within the animals result from um, the animal investigation of the environment. And the response to the environment will lead in turn to a number of uh, uh, brain function that will then uh, lead to specific behaviors. Now, it's very important to understand that the brain is not sensitive directly to the environment. The environment provides information about uh, temperature, about uh, the level of light, about the presence of a pressure wave uh, that forms sounds or the presence of chemicals. The brain is not sensitive to these phys physical and chemical properties of the environment. The brain is sensitive to just neural impulse. And so animals have developed specialized organs or sensory organs that are able to translate this uh, specific information that is present in the environment, for example, uh, mechanical signal or temperature, the presence of photons, the presence of uh, chemicals in the environment. Uh, these sensory organs translate those chemical and physical properties into electrical signal, neuronal signal, and these neuronal signals are then encoded within the brain and leads to very specific perception and uh, behavioral responses. Now, these seem very obvious, but it is not that obvious. And I think to illustrate how things could go wrong, I would like to describe to you a very interesting condition happening in, in humans in which uh, these 
um, phenomenon, these mechanisms are actually uh, going wrong. And um, this is a, a syndrome called synesthesia in which people experience the blending of two or more senses. And to illustrate this is this uh, very nice uh, image taken that from an article in Scientific American in which um, the, uh, that illustrate uh, some of the anomalies in uh, the perception of people with synesthesia. So for example, when um, they are hearing a sound, it brings the uh, perception of a color in our brain. Or when they are tasting a, a particular food, um, a shape, the perception of a shape comes into their brain. So you might wonder what's going on here and is there a possibility that people who associate so tightly a number or letter with a particular color after all might just be in, um, uh, this might just be resulting from a particular experience in childhood. For example, they had magnet on their fridge that had number with specific colors, and therefore that's how they see. And um, some scientists were able to demonstrate very clearly that it was not coming from sensory experience, from previous experience or, or training, but rather from some very unusual properties of the brain, the function of the brain of, of these uh, persons. And um, what illustrates this extremely well is um, the following test, in which what you can see here is a collection of numbers and um, you see if you look closely it's mainly five if you look a little bit more closely you can see that there are some number two around if you were looking very closely it would take you a few minutes to find where all the number two are um, intermingled within the number five but uh, a person affected by, with synesthesia would actually tell you right away where the number two are because uh, the people who have uh, synesthesia and see numbers with specific colors will immediately have the number two uh, stri striking out as having those very specific colors. So in two seconds they would immediately tell where the number twos are. So this is just to give you an example of the difference between detecting um, a particular sensory stimulus and the perception of the stimulus. We take it for granted that uh, um, a pressure wave lead to a particular sound or a particular uh, wavelength of photons give rise to a particular color. But in fact, the brain is the one that established the link between a particular sensory detection and the associated perception. And this goes through a number of layers within the brain. And what my lab is interested in is understanding what these layers are. What are the mechanisms that lead from the detection to the perception to the change in behavior? Now, our system of interest is the olfactory system. And the primary event in olfactory detection is uh, happening at the level of the olfactory epithelium in the nasal cavity, in which specific specialized neurons called olfactory neurons um, are located. These neurons are bipolar neurons. They have a cell body in the olfactory epithelium a sensory dendrite that terminates with a sensory structure called an olfactory knob. And this is the structure in which the receptors and the ion channel are located that will lead to the chemical signal transduction that will then be translated into an electrical signal. And the second, the axonal uh, portion of this neuron then project to the brain. Now, there are different types of olfactory signal. The olfactory signal we are mainly uh, familiar with are signals that provide some uh, information about the environment. The presence of food, the presence of uh, enjoyable stimuli, the, the presence of uh, unpleasant stimuli, or maybe a danger, something to avoid. And uh, the primary event happened at the level of the olfactory uh, cavity, where 
specific receptor molecule detects particular uh, odorants, and this information is then translated and transmitted to the brain and lead to behavioral responses. Now, these type of responses to food or uh, uh, pleasant or unpleasant uh, stimuli are to a large part result from um, your experience throughout life and uh, things that you've been enjoying or enjoying less. And so um, the cortical areas of the brain are thought to be responsible from this type of processing that again can be largely experienced, largely modified by experience. So for example, you can have a very uh, unpleasant encounter associated with a particular perfume and you will hate this perfume all uh, throughout your life. Um, another person will have a very different reaction to that particular smell. Now, another type of chemical signals that are perceived by animals are the pheromones. The definition of pheromones are chemicals that are emitted by animals within a species and enable this animal to communicate with each other. For example, provide information about the gender of the animal. Is this a male, a female, or is it an animal uh, that is uh, a kin? Um, so it provides information about the identity, the sexual and genetic identity of the animal, it enabled them to uh, establish um, the animal group, uh, recognize dominant animal, recognize animals that are ready to mate, recognize rivals, etc. What is very uh, striking about pheromones is these lead to um, um, what are thought to be instinctive behavior uh, that lead to aggressive behavior or mating behavior. So those are really chemical that are essential for the reproduction and the survival of the species and obviously an animal cannot rediscover um, at each new generation uh, who are uh, the potential mate or the potential rivals and so these type of circuitry um, are thought to be uh, largely innate um, and, and lead to uh, the trigger of, of this very reproducible uh, behavior uh, within an animal species. And this is particularly striking in, um, in rodents that are mainly recognizing their environment using olfactory cues and therefore, therefore provide a terrific experimental system in order to uh, study the molecular biology of smell, the molecular biology of pheromone detection, and and how our behaviors initiated from the stimulation of these sensory signals. So this is a cartoon that summarizes very briefly uh, what has been the work that has been done mainly in the laboratory of Richard Axel and Linda Buck um, on the molecular biology of smell. So um, odorants are detected in the nasal cavity by a structure called the olfactory epithelium and uh, neurons in the olfactory epithelium here represented by uh, these uh, different colors each express a different olfactory receptor gene and therefore each population of olfactory neuron can recognize a very specific subset of odorant signal. These odorant signals are detected uh, lead to the uh, excitation of these olfactory neurons that will transmit information to the brain and in the brain they form specific structural glomeruli that are essential for the coding of um, olfactory information in the first relay station of the brain called the olfactory bulb. So this uh, site is thought to be mainly responsible from the detection of odorant signal and lead to uh, the cognitive perception of a smell. And in contrast, um, it has been assumed for a long time, and I will discuss this much further in detail during uh, this presentation, the detection of pheromones is thought to occur in a different structure of the nose called the vomonasal organ, or uh, VNO for short, and uh, this structure is very different morphologically. Um, it's in the septum of the nose, so the septum is the cartilage that is in the middle of the nose. It has a tubular structure such that uh, the pheromones um, 
uh, come into contact with the vormonasal neurons that are located here through a lumen. The lumen is filled up with liquid um, and therefore the pheromones are mainly thought to be non-volatile molecules that are pumped out of the nasal cavity by the vormonasal, uh, the VNO um, structure. And the neurons from the VNO uh, express two types of receptors uh, called V1R, a family of uh, pheromone receptors that we identified uh, many years ago, and uh, the V2Rs, a distinct family of receptors. And neurons expressing these two distinct uh, receptor family then project to an area of the brain called the accessory olfactory bulb. And in a matter uh, slightly different than what's happening in the main olfactory bulb that we've seen before, uh, these chemicals are the, 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 the signal um, triggered by the chemical is then processed by this area of, of the brain and then uh, sent to uh, higher brain structures.